I'm uh, uh, an academic uh, at Brunel Law School at Brunel University in London, uh, where I coordinate uh, with my good colleague, uh, Professor Julian Petley, uh, the Knowing Our Rights uh, Research uh, uh, Project. Uh, and the aim of this project is to research and deepen awareness around the European Convention on Human Rights and its impact, its influence uh, in the United uh, Kingdom. Now, uh, tonight's uh, event uh, is uh, a part of the Being Human uh, uh, Festival uh, uh, of, of the Humanities, and uh, that is the biggest uh, uh, festival of the humanities uh, in, uh, in the country. Uh, the topic this uh, year uh, is, um, is the idea of uh, lost, uh, lost and found, lost and found ideals, um, lost and found rights. But tonight we, we are reversing that. Uh, so we, we are talking about rights that we have found, that we have discovered back in 19, uh, or rediscovered back in 1998 with the incorporation of the European Convention on Human Rights. We brought rights back home in a way, but now we are risking losing these rights. As uh, I'm sure you know, um, we have had a long debate about potentially moving away from Strasbourg, from the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, and potentially repealing the Human Rights Act. Uh, under David Cameron, the, con the, the Conservatives, the, the government, uh, made the pledge that they were going to repeal the Human Rights uh, Act. Now, more recently, with the 2017 um, election manifesto, they said that, well, for the time being, we're going to stay in the Convention for the life of this Parliament. So, in a way, they, they treated rights, our human rights, as, as a commodity, you know, as a product uh, uh, with a use-by date. We can use these rights, we can enjoy these rights, at least for the life of this parliament. And once we have finished with Brexit, we will revisit uh, the issue. So, I mean, a, a characteristic example of, of, of these, of the threats that are, are still very present, uh, uh, is the fact that only weeks uh, after the publication of the manifesto, we had Theresa May in the immediate aftermath of the London Bridge uh, bombings saying, I'm going to rip human rights laws if they impede the introduction of new counter-terrorism legislation. And that was despite the fact that the reviewer, the independent reviewer of terrorism has said on a number of occasions that we do not need the introduction of new anti-terror laws. Now, tonight we'll be tackling uh, uh, this uh, controversial and always uh, challenging uh, issue. We'll be discussing uh, terrorism and, and human rights. Uh, uh, we have a wonderful uh, panel. I'd like to, to thank uh, uh, Roy uh, Greenslade in particular, uh, the, the, the chair, for bringing the panel together. Uh, I'd like to, to thank the, the Front uh, uh, Line Club for, for hosting us uh, uh, here uh, tonight, and I'd like to, I mean, I don't want to take any more of your time, we have very thought-provoking, uh, very uh, challenging uh, conversation, there's no doubt. I'd just like to, to call uh, upon you to, to engage with the conversation, there will be a Q&A uh, session in the end. At the same time, there is a conversation uh, online, so the event is being live tweeted, uh, I think it's being live, Facebooked, or whatever you, you call uh, uh, that. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, please uh, uh, feel free to, to engage with us uh, and we will look forward to answering your questions uh, uh, here but also online. I think that you have uh, the hashtags and everything on the program at the back of the program that was uh, given to you. Once again, uh, thank you very much. A very warm welcome from the part of the team uh, and uh, very much looking forward to the debate. Thank you. Okay. I'm, I'm going to make a, a short opening statement. Before that, I'll just introduce the speakers. On my uh, left, uh, far left, is, uh, and I don't mean that politically, is uh, Will Self, who's a writer, broadcaster, professor of contemporary thought at Brunel University. And his prolific output includes nine novels, six collections of short stories, six non-fiction books, <coughs> plus newspaper and... Uh, magazine articles and so on. He's an exemplar, uh, you probably won't mind me saying this, but I think he's an exemplar of a public intellectual. And uh, good chap altogether. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, I'm, Roy. I'm picking, you up. I'm picking you up, Will, early on. Uh, on my immediate left is Anthony Glees, Professor of Politics at Buckingham University, where he's also Director 
of the Centre for Security and Intelligence Studies, member of the International Advisory Board of several institutions, including the Centre of Policing, Intelligence and Counterterrorism at Macquarie University in Australia, and is also on the advisory board of the Journal of Intelligence Ethics. Uh, on my immediate right is Tasneem Akunji, a lawyer, a solicitor working in the field of complex crime with a focus on terrorism and uh, terrorism-related uh, offending. He's been engaged in the field of uh, defence work from 1999 onwards, responsible for negotiating also the release of individuals uh, caught up in the conflict in Syria. Is that right? And then on the far right is Pat McGee, a former IRA volunteer, jailed for his part in the 1984 bombing of the Grand Hotel in Brighton, released uh, in 1999 under the Good Friday Agreement. In that uh, hotel, five people were killed, including a Conservative MP, Sir Anthony Berry. Now, in November 2000, Sir Anthony's daughter, Jo Berry, met Pat, and since then, a friendship has developed, and through her charity called Building Bridges for Peace, she and Pat have appeared many times together in public to talk about conflict resolution. In fact, Pat was talking with her uh, in, on a platform in, in Spain a, a day or so ago. So that's our panel. I, I just want to just make a, a quick general statement opening. I think rights, uh, and, and some people seem to forget this, are not a gift. They, we didn't get them from God, uh, and we didn't really uh, get them from any government. Uh, we had to win them. But they were created invented, as it were, by human beings on the basis that every human being is entitled to them. In essence, the belief that informs the claim that such rights, is the, uh, that those rights exist, is the notion that all people should be able to live with dignity. So it follows that denials of human rights amount to denials of our basic humanity. The concept of there being human rights stretches back at least as far as the Greek philosophers. But human rights were famously codified uh, at the dawn of the Age of Enlightenment, notably during the French Revolution, when we got that magnificent document, uh, the Declaration for the Rights of Man. I happen to adore the man who wrote the Rights of Man, uh, uh, Mr. Thomas Paine. Anyway, that's the declaration that begins with that ringing phrase about all men being born free and equal, and contains, however, a clause which says, liberty consists in the freedom to do everything which injures no one else. Which, of course, is the subject of this evening's debate. If you kill someone, thus depriving them of the possibility of, inhuming, of enjoying their human rights, indeed, depriving them of their right to life, do you, the killer, as a result, deserve to lose your rights? Now that's fraught enough as an ethical conundrum in a single killing. But when it's a multiple killing, when it's an act or deemed to be an act of terrorism, uh, does that raise the bar? Although terrorism itself can be hard to def define because you know that adage about one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, um, we have to accept, I think, that terrorism is a premeditated act which results in death. Even if the intention was not to kill, it is a premeditated act. And in such cases, we are posing the thought that is it not reasonable for the terrorist to lose his or her claim to rights that are shared by non-terrorists? Or is it the case that rights can never be removed or shouldn't be removed? Because in a purist definition of their existence, they exist independently of the law or of government. In other words, rights are fundamental to the human condition. They're inalienable. They can't be taken away. So that uh, is what we're going to discuss here. I hope in less worthy and uh, so on a less worthy fashion. Um, so I'm going to start uh, with Will um, to say, uh, just ask you the straightforward question, Will. Should terrorists have human rights? Well, I don't want to muddy the waters, but inevitably I'm going to end up doing that. 
Uh, I strongly disagree with Roy's opening statement. I don't think the Greek philosophers give an account of the kind of human rights that Tom Paine do at all. I think human rights are a human invention. I just and said I the think, concept stretched back. Right, but, well, but, yeah, but, but you know, you constructed a tautology essentially, Roy, because you want human rights to be inalienable because it suits you, your you, post enlightenment you liberal that. approach to things to, to do that question. But I think a lot of the problems that we, that we have in confronting the issues raised by terrorism and dealing with the consequences of terrorism actually do arise from the ascription human rights because the very ascription itself leads people into the cul-de-sac of assuming that they're inalienable and that they obtain to everybody by virtue simply of being human. Stick insects don't have rights. They're, you know, rabbits don't have rights. Uh, you know, human rights are a legacy of a, of a theocratic perspective, actually, on, on things. And, and I think that in order to settle the issue of how to deal with people who are accused uh, and convicted of terrorism, we need to set that word human to one side. And I think it will help clarify our thinking about who has rights, what those rights are, what responsibilities they entail, and under what circumstances they can be abrogated or alienated from that individual. So my opening statement is, can we just park the word human? Because it, it is utterly confusing. So for example, think about what Demetrios said at the beginning, because in a sense, this debate is pivoted on this issue of whether Britain is gonna resolve from its commitment to the European court in that way and the European Declaration on Human Rights. And you can immediately see that that relates to a supernatural structure. They're not, it's not directly tied to the EU, but it overlaps and it folds over on top of the EU. And what makes it viable to some extent is the existence of the European community that in, in, enables, and this is surely the key thing that makes a nonsense of that word human rights, is in order to have a right, it needs to be enforceable. And what we're really talking about now is how if we resile from the European Human Rights Convention, it's going to become less and less possible either to enforce certain kinds of uh, sanction against people who've engaged in terrorist acts, or indeed to correctly understand what the mechanisms, what the activities of the secret state and the manifest state are in the pursuit of its aims. Uh, so, so that's a kind of local contingent political problem and it doesn't relate to the philosophic status of human rights but nonetheless I think constant banding around when you talk particularly to younger people you really can have conversations with them Roy in which they seem to believe that a human is born with certain kinds of rights their indignation at the fact that there are humans in the world that are deprived of things derives from the loose description of human rights that is always done by liberals, and I, and I, I think it's time to stop. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, let's be practical now. Um, Anthony, what would you have to say? Well, um, the first thing I have to say is thank you very much for inviting me here. Ten years ago, I was a professor at Brunel, and um, I think there was nobody at the university I valued more highly than Julian Petley. I'm delighted to see him totally unchanged um, sitting here. Um, in respect of these very big issues, may I say, first of all, that of course everybody should have rights in a liberal democracy. And what this is about is the rights of people and the rights of people, as you put it, Roy, to live with dignity. And the question we have to address is what do we do with those people in our society who want to take away from everybody, or some people, the right to live with dignity? What kind of rights do they have? And my comments, my interests, are chiefly confined to what goes on in liberal democratic societies. So Roy's old chestnut about one person's um, terrorist being another person's freedom fighter, and it's complete and utter nonsense in a liberal democracy where you have a vote like everybody else and you can use your vote democratically. I remain a Remainer. I've been a Remainer even before it became a concept. However, I accept unequivocally 
the fact that the people of this country have voted to leave the European Union, and that is what democracy says, even though I think it is an act of total stupidity, I have to say. We have to make it, we have to make it work. So my comments are about liberal democracies, they're about a Britain whose politics are totally fluid, and I, I heard what you said about European Convention on Human Rights. I've actually just come from one of the meetings I've had in London, been in the Home Office, uh, because the Home Office has been, or the government has been challenged by privacy, by David Davis, uh, before he became a minister, um, and decided he wanted to be on the side of the stupas rather than on the side of the people who stupas charge it. Yeah. Um, who have assured me that all their current legislation and their future legisla legislation uh, involving the interception of communications, therefore intelligence led actively, will continue to be consistent with the European Convention on Human Rights and with the European Court of Justice rulings on these matters. So uh, for the foreseeable future, I don't think this country is going to be leaving the European Court of Justice, and I don't think this country is going to be leaving the European Court of Human Rights. Um, you know, weeks a long time in politics, we can't, can't be sure, but at the moment that is the case. So the lawfulness of this country is still rooted in the idea of um, Europeanness, and as everybody knows, the European Court of Human Rights was something that Britain helped construct after the Second World War, and I think most lawyers would simply not practice in this country. We walked away from that. European Court of Justice, that's a European Union thing, and we, we could. If we leave it, though, every single one of the other EU 27 states, security and intelligence and police agencies, won't work together with us. That's, okay. it, that's the end of it. So it's important that this be maintained. And if I may say just one final word about terrorism and how you deal with terrorism. I believe, I'm, it is precisely because I believe so strongly in lawfulness and a, a strong state that I believe on the one hand we should be party to the European uh, Court of Justice, European Court of Human Rights, but also that we should chase terrorists with all the means at our proposal because they wish to take away the dignity of others. And of those people who have opted to go and fight for the so-called Islamic State, which has nothing to do with the peaceful religion of Islam, I say they have actually lost a key right, and that key right is their British citizenship. Okay, j just let me come back uh, for a second to liberal democracy. Say within the liberal democracy, there, are, there is a place or a group of people <laughs> who feel that their rights can't be uh, exercised within that liberal democracy. Then would that justify terrorism? No. As I said, I, I think we, this country has made the most idiotic decision imaginable. I think it has made it partly as a result of subversion, partly as a result of lies, and partly out of a sort of emotionless nationalism. However, it is the decision that has been taken, and people like me who don't like it, jolly well got to put up with it. But I'm, I'm, I was thinking of the Northern Ireland context, because we've got Pat here. I was thinking that a group of people within Northern Ireland felt that they couldn't, through the ballot box, exercise the power that some people, you know, gerrymandered states and so on, so they fought back through terrorism. Were they not justified? No, absolutely not. And the British state was right to use all the means it had at its disposal in order to stop terror. The, 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 the Irish situation, again, another reason I'm in favor of uh, Remain, because it has helped, European Union has helped, very important ways bring peace to Northern Ireland. One reason peace came to Northern Ireland is not because the British state was defeated by the IRA and the people who blew up innocent people in the hotel in Brighton. Not because of that, but because we won the security war at great cost. Irish terrorists, chiefly the IRA, but also on the other side, we shouldn't forget them either, I know. they realised they could not win. And the moment they realised they could not win, they came to the conference table. And that is exactly where they should be. They've been at the conference table since Sunningdale in 1971. <laughs> uh, well, that's... Uh, uh, 71? Yeah. They were under... under so, anyway, let me, let me not weigh, weigh in myself here. Um, uh, Pat McGee, you, you uh, uh, were a member of the IRA. The IRA decided to... Uh, 
a physical false response to the British state. Having heard what Anthony's had to say, do you think, and he doesn't believe terrorism can ever be justified, uh, how would you react? Oh, I suppose uh, my first reaction would be to the usage of this word terrorism. It's a, a concept that defines nothing. It's a catch-all. Every incident around the world and movement, if you don't like it, it's a terrorist movement. It's part of this big you know, global crackdown for selfish motivations, as far as I'm concerned. In the context of uh, the north of Ireland, uh, they're talking about a state, you used the word gerrymandered earlier on, a state that was uh, a, a country that was partitioned against the will. Nobody voted to be partitioned, you know. It, uh, real violence was uh, perpetrated on the nationalist community at that time, the copper fasten partition, and has been resisted in every decade since. And uh, uh, part of the uh, armory of the state, and the terrorism of the state, and the abuses of power of the state has meant uh, my family, for instance, being uprooted and having to escape over rooftops in the 20s, uh, poverty in my family, and that's written large over our communities. There was a direct impact on the terrorism of the state on our communities. And we have a, a culture of resistance to that. We want the end partition. I'm not even a nationalist. It doesn't really matter as much. But you see, partition, partition more than a country. It partitioned people. And it was done in a divide and conquer way. So that is a human rights issue for me. Uh, I'm called a terrorist. I'm called a lot of things, to be perfectly honest. And it's one of the great ironies of it. That, from my perspective, I spent most of my adult life fighting terrorism. Fighting the terrorism of the British state. And that of course poses the problem uh, I'll, I'll come to you in a second uh, uh, Will that if you are confronted even in a liberal democracy where you've carved out something which is not your vote doesn't count um, would that justify terrorism in those circumstances well I think I, I, I agree with Pat I think that it's a, it's a catch all and it doesn't help it's a bit like human rights the two uh, well, that's stand and nebulous point. ideas yeah. that can be deployed how people want. But when it comes to the systemic violence of the state, you know, it's always nice to hear somebody trotting out. A liberal democracy is like sort of saying hoogie, or sort of posting a picture of yourself with a kitten. It looks good. <laughs> you just keep saying liberal democracy and everybody would think you're nice. The state fundamentally constitutes itself as a monopoly on violence. That's what it exists for, right? And that's how it constitutes itself. So when any organization constitutes itself as a monopoly on violence, it's going to object to the deployment of violence in any context it doesn't control, and it's going to label it as terrorism if it sees fit. Now listen, here's the thing that nobody wants to say, we might as well say it, I'm sitting next to you and I'd like to watch you melt down internally. <laughs> no, no. The fact of the matter is, if we, if we move away from... from issues in, in Ireland uh, and move to Islamic State, which you made a very, very strong statement about. You know, just because you're paranoid, it doesn't mean they aren't out to get you. Uh, just because there are individuals, uh, Islamist individuals, who are committed to the destruction of our state, doesn't mean that our state doesn't love it because it's the greatest opportunity for professional closure that the state knows. And if you look at the chief tub thumpers of uh, labeling people as terrorists, exciting anxiety about terrorism, promoting a sense of an embattled state, then you'll see that they're people like Michael Gove, an ex-journalist. They are not people, or Boris Johnson, who can't keep his trousers on and wanders around looking disheveled. Uh, the people who are the big cheerleaders on behalf of the state for its monopoly on violence are men and women very often who have no experience of that kind of world at all and rely on their posture to give substance to the monopoly that they themselves wish to enjoy. 
So we need to understand that and understand that the war on terror is often a convenient state fiction before we can even unbolt what it is we should do about, as it were, these other terrorists. But to answer your question, finally, Roy, do I think it is in any circumstances justified by a population within a state to take up arms against that state? Yes, of course it can be, under all sorts of circumstances. Was it justified in the particular circumstances that arose out of the civil rights marches in Northern Ireland in the early 1960s to then take up arms against the British state? It's a very, very dubious question, and, I, and I'm not so sure I agree with Pat's argument that the historic violation of the rights of the minority community in Northern Ireland acted as a justification for the resumption of physical force republicanism in the 1960s. I don't think that's a very strong argument. I think it was understandable that people did resort for violence in chaotic circumstances, but I think that the particular character of the campaign that the Irish Republican Army fought disbarred them from the kind of sympathy that you might have had towards people who wanted to call themselves freedom fighters. Tassin, I want you to uh, come in here for a second. Uh, uh, who, who, you, you dealt um, at least with ISIS, or not with ISIS itself perhaps, but with the victims of ISIS, or those people who felt uh, that they wanted to go and fight for ISIS. Uh, how did they justify their acts of terror? Well, before I get into that, I'm a bit confused about where Will Self is in terms of what rights are, generally. Okay. Um, thankfully, we live in a country where people have agreed that human beings have rights. One is the right not to be killed, and I think that's universal. And and rabbits have rights too, as well. You know, if you were to abuse them, then yeah, but they haven't promulgated themselves. You've never met a rabbit walking down the street with a sign saying rabbits have rights too. No, we've imposed. I'm quite clear about what I think rights are. They derive from the state, or they derive from supranational institutions, if they have the capacity to enforce them. There are, End of story. There are rights that are universal to all human beings because it's hardwired in our biology to be revolted when one human being does that's something. That's not a right. No, I don't know that's that. not a right. Okay, well, uh, I, I agree it's not the right. I, I, I can't see that that can be right because that seems to suggest that they are God given that, it's, that it exists elsewhere. But anyway. Sorry, continue. I, I some sorry. people believe in God and some people don't. But just because they have a different point of view on that means that they use different sources for deriving where rights come from. And this is a fundamentally important point when we're dealing with issues to do with the Middle East and where their concept of rights come from as well. Because their be or the behavior of people in the Middle East will be drawn from a legal structure that they make reference to, which is religious in nature and its absolute source. And so that's what they give, um, they reference with legitimacy for behavior. We <coughs> derive our laws from a different process, which we can argue about whether something is splitting hairs or whether someone should have rights because of their behavior or someone shouldn't, but we have a different source for that. The problem is when you start looking at people as calling them terrorists just by arbitrary label, or can be arbitrary labels, it's because people often say, well, these people are religiously motivated uh, and politically motivated. The problem is, is that many of the people who are speaking about or justifying their behavior in, in ISIS-controlled territory or the Middle East are simply justifying their behavior according to their legal principles, not necessarily their religious principles. And that's often quite a big misunderstanding that we have. For example, when George Bush declares, you're either with us or against us, and he perpetrates war based upon international or breach of international laws, then he's justifying his behavior, that violence visits from others according to a legal structure he understands. Um, others don't agree with that legal structure and draw it from a different source. So, so this is uh, uh, to take up a point made by World, point made, point made by Pat. Terrorism is then a reaction uh, always to uh, acts of the state. I think in, in, in most cases it is, yeah. I, uh, there are state-sponsored terrorism or fake terrorism where, where uh, states will employ violent groups in order to agitate for change in another, in another jurisdiction. I mean, maybe the uh, Russians and, uh, and, and um, Georgia is maybe an example of that. But on, on, on the whole, terrorism is the, is the recourse of last resort for people who have no other voice left apart from a non-vocal one. 
But why then would terrorists... It, I can understand you fight back against the state. That would be a natural thing to do. But why then do you reach out beyond the state and decide to slaughter innocent people? That would... That, it, does, is that justified under those... In other words, George Bush does something, the American state does something, but then you go and bomb people, uh, not you, but I mean, uh, <laughs> terrorists justify bombing, uh, are, are, you know, a, a group of people in Borough Market. I can't see how that is justified. In any particular way, indeed. I mean, um, we can talk about uh, human rights and, and, and what is a terrorist, what isn't there, but in terms of why they would do it, well, that's a branding exercise. That's to draw attention in a disproportionate way to their cause. And often it's justified on the basis that, well, here are a bunch of civilians in a country that they harp from who have been killed. And one, let's say one of the examples of that, where one of the dangers of, of, of departing from human rights is exemplified in why ISIS dress up their prisoners before beheading in orange jumpsuits. They do that as a reference and not on a wing to Abu Ghraib, where we, um, the West, departed from human rights and basic human principles of treating people, then it's an eye for an eye scenario, it's an escalation scenario. And ISIS and Al-Qaeda and the other groups have always justified the uh, targeting of civilians in other countries as a reaction to the targeting of civilians, often with a huge extra number of zeros involved in, in their home countries. Let me uh, put this to you, Pat, because the same question, in a sense, uh, we know that um, out of civil rights, uh, civil rights uh, the civil rights marchers properly put the case that there were that one part of the community, uh, called them nationalist, called them Catholic, but one part of the community didn't have equality in terms of jobs or housing opportunities, uh, educational chances, um, and most importantly, of course, were outvoted all the time. So that's understandable. We fight the state in those circumstances. But what is it that then takes it on to the next point that you say it would be justifiable to kill innocent people? Well, the, the usual way of looking at it is to say that violence only comes onto the agenda when all the other options, can, can I be heard? Yeah. Uh, have been uh, exhausted. And you can look back, I think, and should look back at the early days of the conflict and ask were those other means, uh, extra uh, parliamentary means, etc., uh, what you can do out on the street in terms of agitation, were they fully exploited? What's not really appreciated is, you know, uh, uh, that the IRA came into that equation at a fairly late stage. Before the IRA were active in Belfast, the uh, Loyalists have killed a policeman, they've killed uh, civilians, they've been bombed, they uh, put the blame on the IRA. The state was behind a lot of the shenanigans in the background and, and the run up to these things. The worst, to be honest, I think circumstances played a lot in it too. And perhaps the, the, the biggest uh, uh, I was going to wild card thrown into it was the election of the Heath Government in 19. Um, 72. Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, let me get this right. 70. 70. 70. 70. 1970, Heath was elected. Uh, I'm thinking before that because uh, there was a change in policy. Wilson was out. Heath got in. And then the security policy changed in Belfast. And uh, Heath and his ministers succumbed to the demands from unionists to crack down on nationalist areas. That directly propelled things up into another notch, and the IRA did come into the scenes. You had the, the curfew in Belfast, for example, when the whole uh, area was uh, cordoned off for uh, two or three days, saturated with gas. People, uh, I think it was about five or six people killed. There was there was shooting, etc. But uh, the point is, from that moment on, what was possible for the long was possible. Were uh, Talks could have led to something. Suddenly, the whole situation was deeply militarized. Lack of faith, enormous fear, and in that situation, violence comes under the agenda. So you've got to you got to look at it in the context of the time. I agree with uh, Will's use of the word chaos in those days. That uh, the 
Chaos didn't only come from the, the perpetration of violence, etc. It came about by the deliberate policy of muddy in the water too, that the state was absolutely implicated at an early stage in that conflict from arming one side and turning his back against the violence of one side and focusing on the IRA. They made a decision the IRA was the problem. Okay, Anthony, you uh, uh, attack there over your use of uh, liberal democracy as being a, a wonderful conception, which is so good, uh, no one should ever attack it. And um, uh, now you hear what Pat has to say. But is that not the case that the state uh, could be accused of terrorism? If you think of Bloody Sunday uh, as a perfect example, which now is not now a matter of dispute, uh, even David Cameron felt it necessary to apologize for the shooting of 13 innocent people. So uh, in those circumstances, is it not an example where the liberal democracy you got broke down and allowed the, the forces of the state to do something which was so reprehensible it was understandable that people engaged in terrorism. Well, the rule of law is so important, even to people like myself who aren't lawyers, but the rule of law is so important um, that you have to accept that even liberal democracies can break the law and frequently we have politicians who do try to break the yeah. law. And and we have, the, have, hang on, yeah. we have politicians who also don't understand legal institutions. Story in the Times today about how Theresa May may leaving uh, the European Court of Human Rights. One of her red lines, it was done with her and Nick Timothy, her advisor, without consulting the cabinet in any way. I don't even think that Theresa May or Nick Timothy properly understood the difference between the European Court of Justice, which I think they meant to leave, and the European Court of Human Rights. Now that's, that's become one of the, the red lines in Brexit negotiations. As I've said, it will totally screw up our security relationships with the EU27. It will increase the risk to people in this country of, of terrorist and I utterly oppose it. But it doesn't mean that everything that a liberal democracy does is right. But the fundamental point about liberal democracy is, first of all, that it is required to and judged by its adherence to the law. You just mentioned David Cameron apologising. I mean, I think yeah, I'm but fed that up was, with his apologies. That was 30 years later. OK, but 30 years later. But people, it, it is perfectly possible for a liberal democracy to make a, state, it, a mistake, but it does not cease to be a liberal democracy, and it is never an odious terrorist state. You know, Will Self kind of putting the, I suppose it's the anarchist view that you know, the states are the states are the, the states are the really violent uh, institutions, sort of anarcho-Trotskyite view that the real problem Neither is, is nor a Trotsky. Well, I'm talking about. I'm so not don't talking type about, me in that I, way, I'm please, talking sir. about. I'm talking about what you're saying. The, the never, state, no, you said you're, the state you're misrepresenting the, what you I said. You said the state had the monopoly of violence. That's how it constitutes right. itself. That's not well, an anarchist but, viewpoint. Well, that's a cold me, view well, that's informed by my understanding. You can, of shout, you can, you can well, shout me down if you wish. Good, I will. Well, I will. Then, you can, <laughs> then the audience will be able to weigh up what you're saying in terms of uh, the arguments that you're putting, I don't think people should be shouted down. I listen to what you say. I profoundly disagree with it. I listen to what both the speakers on the right said. I profoundly disagree with it. Now, your the well, audience is, is perfectly entitled. Please just but if they the point, can't, if, if they can't... Will, wait, wait no, a second. No, no, wait no, a second. I want him to answer the point before he types me in a certain yeah. way, because it's not good but debating. It, it's okay. What do you object to? I won't be pointing at It's that. okay to be typed, Why? and then you can come back and be untyped, all right? <laughs> so... Yeah, but he needs to answer the central point. Is he this, needs. So this is that you're interrupting my slot, and if you go on doing it, I'm going to go away, go home, because I, you, you've asked me to talk, and I will talk. And if you disagree with what I have to say, if you tell me to shut up, when the chair tells me to shut up, I will shut up. But I won't be pointed at. You said that the state has the monopoly of violence. The word violence is the key word there, not. It should be the state has the monopoly of force, yeah. not of violence. Now, it's that kind of argument, and I would say it is an anarcho-Trotskyite argument. I'm not interested in what you are. I'm not interested in the self here. I'm interested in the self-arguments. They're anarcho-Trotskyite. Anybody that's done any history will recognize them straight away. 
The liberal state has to live by lawfulness, but it is also very vulnerable. That is the point. The, the, the freedom fighter terrorist argument, I've said, needs to be looked at in the context of the liberal state. If you don't live in a liberal state, the argument looks completely different. And it's not for me, you know, born in 1948 into, into the British welfare state, it's not for me to say that my experience of life um, is, is, is relevant to somebody who is born in a, under a completely different regime without any rights or whatever. Well, so, so what I'm saying is talking about Britain, and I'm talking about, yes, we made terrible mistakes in this country in the past, but fundamentally, we believe in lawfulness and we believe in the dignity of human beings and that that dignity should not be taken from them by people who come in the night to blow them up or people who <coughs> think their violence is justified by dressing the people they're about to slash their throats in, in orange suits. And it's easy, you can get, it's, it's so easy to say, oh, George W. Bush and his war on terror, we could all agree we all hate George W. Bush. It's far more complicated than that. All right, right before you, uh, uh, will you come back and then I want to speak to the, you get the non narco non Trotskyers to come back. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, in terms of if you want to say that uh, Britain is just fundamentally good, you can ask uh, most people in India what they thought about that during occupation. You can ask everyone in Australia. Who, who were Aborigines, you can ask everyone in America who were Red Indians. You know, in terms of that genocidal wave that uh, Britain unleashed on the world, I think that really doesn't uh, doesn't really give us much uh, hope for an inherent goodness in, the, in Britain, particularly when uh, when Tony Blair comes along and then you know tries to add his little cherry to the cake with uh, with uh, George Bush. So so if you believe in a very strong state and it, that and you know there, there's a, there's an argument for order, of course. Um, and that that state is inherently legitimate because it was democratically elected. And why did we fight Nazi Germany? Silence. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to come back to you again, Anthony, to answer that. But uh, uh, Will, you you uh, you you want to make a, a large point about your political? No, you don't want to say anything about your politics, but you do want to make a point uh, in answer to Anthony. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not an anarchist or a Trotsky. I'm not even sure what a narco-Trotskyism is. If it's a semantic problem that you think uh, that because the state has, for example... But uh, can, I, can I just ask you a specific question, then? Uh, you said the state has a monopoly on violence. Yeah, that and, and, no, and no, no, Anthony no. said it was a monopoly of force. Is there a difference between force and violence? And well... I was waiting for you to say that. It's a bit like the freedom fighter terrorist distinction, isn't it? Depends where you're standing, whether something looks like force or violence. I would imagine if you were standing in Derry in the streets that day when the parachute regiment opened fire, you wouldn't have thought of it as force. Okay? And I also, I'm not going to waggle my finger at you anymore, because God forbid that you should go home. That would be so <laughs> I'm a free man. <laughs> but. You know, what your argument seems to rest on is a very, very hazy and indeterminate concept, which is some kind of numinous idea of inherent British decency. That's what lies behind it. No, it is. You just, you just stated it just here. You said, we are a nation that believe in this, and we're like this, and we're like that. I mean, no, I mean this is just a kind of politics of kind of Downton Abbey. It's some kind of hazy kind of, you know, sort of douceur de la vie that you seem to be presenting. Yeah. Hmm? Um, <laughs> not, 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 not at all. Right, I'm, but, I'm, but I'm interested, I'm talking about politics, I'm talking about the way we are now and the way we've been in my lifetime. I'm not talking about okay, his, well, historical right, injustice. Do you we, think, can, we can drive ourselves do you, mad with the historical injustice do you think issues does, of, of does, legality, does to people. Do you think issues of legality and avoidance of legality by the government at the time were implicit in the run-up to the Iraq War, or do you think that's besides the point? That's just a case of the judicious deployment of force. By well, the you're, 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 yeah, it, 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 it's perfectly fair if you've got some very interested in that chappy over there who's sort of agreeing with everything you say. Every kind of historical uh, analogy it reinforces an argument that I suspect he has already decided you've won. I I don't think it can be a question of uh, glibly saying, you know, Tony Blair acted unlawfully in, in the Iraq war, or that Tony Blair lied, or whatever. I, I simply don't think that is true. Tony Blair got a majority of MPs in Parliament 
to go along with it. Well, you, you see, you, I mean, you could always laugh. You could always make a fool of lawfulness. You could always make a liberal democracy out to be a fool because you sometimes liberal democracies don't do what people individuals might want them to do. I've, I've made that clear in the Brexit. Okay, Brexit, so actually, but it's the most basic, crude kind of soapbox oratory to have a go at uh, the, the, the idea of lawfulness and the fundamental fact, which we shouldn't forget, as I say, liberal democracies are very, very fragile. Our own country has never been more fragile in my lifetime than it is today. And I am very aware of the fragility of liberal democracy, and it's because I think it is important that liberal democracy be strengthened that I, I, I come and speak. Uh, to you tonight. Okay. But liberal democracies do not attack other liberal democracies. That is the point. You could argue about Tony Blair, whether he was right or wrong. I'm perfectly prepared to, prepared to do that. But the fundamental point about lawfulness in a liberal democracy is that it provides those who are its enemies with easy means to get rid of it, whilst at the same time being reluctant to fight back for liberal democracy. But it's not and that it doesn't that. attack other liberal democracies. That's, okay, let me, that is the point. Yes. That's basically a racist statement. Why? Because uh, what he's effectively saying is that it's all right for liberal democracies to go and you know attack, let's say, anyone in Africa or Asia or the Middle East, possibly, yeah, because they're not liberal. I haven't basically. said that at all. No, you said it's liberal, 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 liberal democracies. Okay, liberal democracies never attack other liberal democracies. Well, that's all right then. As long as what do you mean it's all right? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental point about liberal democracy. And to say that I then am a racist... You, say, you, know, so you a, did. We said it's a, a racist It's view. a racist point. It's nonsense. Can I, can I just ask, but, Anthony, going to something you said, is lawfulness then always in the eye of the beholder? In other words, is the liberal state, when it makes a mistake, as you call it, that's excusable. When people fight back, that's inexcusable, even though you might say uh, in, in that situation they're making mistakes. Liberal states have to be held to justice, and liberal states provide the means by which they can be held to justice. I mean, think of the amount of money we spend on this country, quite properly, for Supreme Court, Courts of Appeal, etc., etc. That's absolutely fundamental. And as I say, it is the mark of a demagogue that when they don't like to accept a <coughs> decision or ruling, they say the judges are bent, the, these people are bent, the state is bent, as, as, as if that were a, a satisfying a political or philosopher, philosophical position. It absolutely isn't. We have a duty to maintain the lawful state and to protect it from its enemies. And to say that it is racist it just, it, I hope that illustrates to the audience how pathetically weak those arguments, uh, the arguments against that are. The state, of course, can make mistakes, but the importance of bringing people to justice. You talked about Nazi Germany. I'm not quite sure what 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 point you you want you want to make about Nazi Germany, but uh, the fact that the United Kingdom, together with the United States and France. Uh, denazified uh, the western part of Germany, investigated over six million Nazi party members, how many, I'm opposed to the death penalty, but we executed many people. Uh, we created, we created a, uh, in many ways, a model, lawful, liberal, democratic society out of the ruins of totalitarianism in Germany. That's what a liberal democracy can do. Well, the sad part of that is, is that it was because of all that spilt blood that we got human rights so that we could avoid that sort of process again uh, to emoliate against that and the idea that we will lord ourselves for being decent at one point in history and then throw away all the benefits of that by saying that look here's some individuals where human rights uh, help them um, and they are undesirables is, is, is to throw away a huge gain for crumbs of just well, I think that, you know there's a paradox here, which which is exemplified by me, the, for me, by the prosecution by the government of Phil Shiner, um, because 
Explain. And, uh, well, Phil Shiner was the lawyer who, who attempted to bring a series of class actions against the British government on behalf of uh, various Iraqis who claimed to have been uh, harmed by the mistaken application of force, as Anthony would probably like to put it, by the British Army. And uh, in the process of uh, having Phil Shiner struck off, and this was a case that the then Defence Minister, Michael Fallon, announced to Parliament that he was going to take up personally, and it was a case in respect of which Theresa May, our current Prime Minister, stated that she would never see British soldiers hobbled by the United Nations uh, Human Rights Declaration in their activities on, on the battlefield. So what essentially the Prime Minister was saying was that battlefields were human rights free zones, or at any rate, the battlefields that liberal democracies choose to designate as such. In other words, you're not a liberal democracy, Anthony. We can invade your country, and whatever we do to your citizenry in the process of invading your country, that's no longer held subject to the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights. So that's the current position of HMG. And the fact that the British government itself were using exactly the same methods as China's practice were to gather witness statements and to deal with these cases. Incidentally, the cases that China was bringing have never been examined, okay? So what's going on there exactly? What's going on there is that this whole idea of yours, that liberal democracies tend to just apply force and occasionally make mistakes, is being exposed as being incorrect. So how does the liberal democracy behave? It changes the goalposts. In fact, it gets rid of them altogether. Well, beyond that as well, in terms of the idea that liberal democracy is good because it provides a self-regulating justice system, that's exactly the system we're dismantling in this austerity period. We're taking away uh, legal aid from people in all manner of scenarios, and the, and the worst possible scenario is where people are disabled and on benefits and now can no longer afford, because of the removal of legal aid in those circumstances, to actually challenge illegal decisions by even the most low level of officials. Now, if we are taking away the ability to self-regulate, then how can we possibly have a check and balance on a liberal democracy remaining such? I want to, um, I, I'm, I'm sure I don't want to come back on that, but I, I want to go back to, to Pat for a second. Pat, it, it, the, the IRA in pursuit of the, of the British state, um, uh, in, in, op in opposing the British state, uh, was guilty of a number of what are just generally regarded as atrocities. Um, and uh, do you have a regrets <coughs> about that? Two days ago was the uh, anniversary of the Birmingham bomb. Yes. There was 21 people killed by a The worst atrocity on this, uh, on this island during the trouble. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, can you hear me again? Uh, well, I can remember exactly where I was when, when that happened. Uh, I was in uh, Cage 2 of Long Cash. I was interned. And and that, and that this was not, wasn't too long after we burned the camp down, so we were actually sleeping out rough. And that's beside the point. But I remember how shocked we were at that. We were absolutely devastated at that. It wasn't only that one action, there was a lot. And the skill? That's much later. later. Yeah. Much later. That's one of the things that needs to be borne in mind the longevity of that struggle and all the things that happened. And it wasn't like a seamless. It had its own, you know, tides, etc. Uh, my, my, my point is, there was a lot of things happening then that were absolutely devastating in terms of what we were trying to do, you know. I mean, most of the uh, thinking that led to, to our political development was first aired in the presence, and in my own case, you know, uh, the debates around our weaknesses, our political weaknesses, you know. Then suddenly, an atrocity like that, well, I'm not going to argue that it wasn't designed, we all know, uh, I hope you should accept that wasn't designed, nobody set out to kill those people, but it's still, people were killed. That set us back. Everything like, when something like that happened, it set us back. 
and with our own uh, meager resources, uh, our own people and our experience, etc., we try to correct it. We try to do that, for instance, about tightening warnings and all of that. And then still bombs went off and killed people. You've got to bear in mind that we were not only chaos, but there were forces around us trying to undermine us too. Do you, do you, do you know that uh, uh, there were groups of people, uh, Republicans and Loyalists, arrested, broke, brought away to a special holding centre and trained? Now that happened. Uh, it happened in Pal uh, Palace Barracks, Hollywood, in 1972. Uh, I remember one of them turned again, came back to us and explained it all. These things were happening. You, I remember being in, in the cash and somebody said to me, that, because we had a, quite a few ex-servicemen. These are people who had been out in Aden. They'd known the end of a couple of years before this. Uh, or they'd been out in Malaysia, etc. They, the same tactics were employed and they were doing them in, in Belfast. And the same people employing them were the ones who employed them in, in those other places, Kitson, etc., and others. So that was the chaos in the background to some of the things that was going wrong. We uh, did our best to change, to correct it, but we were always under pressure and mistakes were made. So I'm now, saying, do we, do we leave the battlefield and say, we're just going to give up, put our hands up, and we'll just take whatever you can, you know? So are you saying that we peace, try to get it right? The peace process was born in those in that in that era. I would say, I would say, if you wanted to get out of that struggle, we had to do uh, correct our biggest weakness. And our biggest weakness was we, we we didn't have the politics because the war just landed on us. And it wasn't until we started to build politically that there was that alternative to it. In other words, violence comes out of weakness, not the violence of state. That comes out of the abuse of power. Our violence came out of weakness. And in the, the, in the 70s and in the jails, we were looking at this and constantly trying to figure out how to develop. And we thought the best way to do it was to develop at a community level. And that was in, in progress. That developmental work was in progress, which would, I think, and be eventually lead to us getting around a negotiating table. Uh, an enormous thing happened, the state's overreaction to try and defeat the Republican movement in the jails, which culminated in the hunger strikes. That was a catalyst for a massive change. At, uh, it projected, you know, our, we might have had to uh, do that developmental work for another 10 years if it hadn't been for that hunger strike. You know, the British government got us so wrong over that. You know, that was a, the biggest boost we had politically. Did you support the peace process? Of course I support the peace process. And I, I think one should recognise, it's easy to get a, uh, a support by talking about Tony Blair lying and illegally taking the country to war, etc. We shouldn't forget the role that Tony Blair played in bringing peace to Northern Ireland. And not just peace as such, but peace on a constitutional basis that our present government seems cluelessly to want to be undermining because what Tony Blair said was that the only way of resolving the, the conflict in Ireland which is a deep-seated deep-rooted historical conflict going back many hundreds of years let's be honest about that is for people to throw away the idea of crude nationalism and accept that you can you can have an, an identity to more than one entity. So you can be Northern Irish and European and part of the Republican Ireland of Ireland. You can be Northern Irish and Protestant, part of the Why Union of the United Kingdom. Why can't you support Kingdom. Islamic State and, and also and, be British? And, so <laughs> uh, so the, 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 you, you can have multiple identities based on the idea of lawfulness and liberal democracy. No, but you're depriving no, you're, people no, of their well, nationality. No, I'm, not, I'm, I'm saying that people who went to fight for the so-called Islamic State effectively threw away their British passport and swore allegiance Why? to another state because they fought for a state <coughs> whose ideals were the complete antithesis of everything that I think most decent people, and I hope I would include you 
stand for. Would you, but let would me just, you remove let me, let somebody's just, uh, passport if they fought just, for just the just IDF? Yeah, we're, 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 so the IDF. Yeah, if they fought for the IDF, would you remove their passport? If, if they fought, sorry, the IDF, so this is about the Jews, is it? Not about Jews. It's we're, about we're kind of afraid. I, I would really like to. I, you know, I'm the, just the, asking you a question. You see, you have such a fine legal mind. I don't. I, I don't have a. Le- I'm not a lawyer at all. Well, I, you have I, such I, a discriminating I, I logical I mind. No, I'd like to see no. you cookie cutter this. You're, one. you're, you're, you're a kind of cynical, interrupting um, <laughs> debater, and I'm not that, that's that's cynical. that's fine. But I would just like to answer. A previous point you made. We can talk about Israel. It's another one of these, and and and, and Palestine, and so on. another one of these kind of long his stories of historical injustice that affects more than one side in this. As I accept in the case of Northern Ireland, all I'm saying is, any sane, rational person must welcome the fact that lawful democratic practice has been brought onto the island of Ireland in part through our adherence to the European Union, something that the British people in their wisdom decided to throw away right, last year. But, 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 but you did say Will, Will Self also said, I just want to say about Phil Shiner, and, and he said, oh, you know, Phil Shiner, it proves the British state. Uh, the people who got rid of, excuse me, spitting at you, the people who no. got rid of Phil Shiner were his fellow lawyers. I used to be good at chairing he, debates. He, sorry, well, I'll shut up if you tell me to shut no, up. So no, but, no, but, but Phil Shiner has been mentioned. Phil Shiner was kicked out by his own legal profession, not by the government, and he was kicked out because he broke one of the fundamental rules of fair legal practice in this country that you should not pay people for testimony. Which is what the Ministry of so, Defence so, are already so, doing. Well, you know, this relative they were, it's, it's on the record. All right. I just wanted to come back on one thing. You you, you, you supported the peace process, of course. course, but you did say early on the IRA were defeated. Now, um, we know that there was massive collusion. Uh, <coughs> I said the IRA, just uh, we skate over this point. Yeah. Because I said the IRA came to the table to take to make peace because Jerry Adams, other leaders, understood they could never win the security war, but they could win the political war. And we just heard that expressed far more far more poignantly in, in one way that, than I can ever do it. That's the process. That has been the peace process where people have turned their backs on violence and turned their backs on violence because they were not able to win and they could join in okay, the democratic I'm going, process. I'm going to ask and that, is the, that is the, the, the ideal and that is the essence of the liberal I'm, democratic I'm, going, I'm well. going to make Ideable. this single suggestion that, and this, is, this goes to the heart of what the debate is supposed to be about. Here is a state that misbehaves, the liberal democracy doesn't give rights to a group of people. They fight back, and in fighting back, gradually, they realize that they but what want rights? To just But so what rights that the British, that what rights were taken from they didn't have. They didn't well, have equal housing. They didn't have equal jobs. Uh, the, their well, education. Uh, 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 so, so you don't so need legal rights. No, I'm talking you, you about, about their civil rights. rights. Their right. civil rights were, were, were not as equal as the majority population. So they fight back. And then, in fighting back, they gradually win these rights. Uh, they win rights which are, which are gradually, grudgingly granted by the state, and one of the reasons the state grants them is because of the act of terrorism. Was therefore terrorism justified? It, it, would they have had those rights without them fighting back? In other words, that would justify terrorism, would it not? That's just, the, just asking, as say so. You're asking me, well, or everybody. Ter- well, I, I do not I'll, believe I'll ask women, sir. terrorism yeah. is never justified in a liberal democratic state. It is never justified. Now, you start talking about states that are not liberal democracies. If you talk about South Africa, for example, if you talk well, we're about... We're not. Uh, well, <laughs> we're not. That's, that's my point. Because there, I think, it's a, it's a very difficult judgment. And it's not a judgment that somebody born in this country and, and 
lives in this country can make about people who I defend vigorously my right to free speech. One reason I'm at the University of Buckingham, but don't think I don't get it in the net. I get it in the net even, as I said on the Jeremy Mine program, you need academic freedom, chiefly from your own academic colleagues who try and get you sacked if they don't like what you say. And most of the general public, if you're not part of the university, you probably won't realise that that is the case. It's not just daft politicians like Christopher Heaton Harris who said, who's teaching European studies where we, we want to come after you? It is your fellow academics. So the freedom of speech, the right of lawful freedom of speech, all these things are terribly important and they are a feature of the liberal democratic state. They're not a feature of states that are different. And how would you believe? How would you act if you were denied the freedom to speak out? If you lived in the Third Reich? or in, South, in, in apartheid South Africa, or if you were a, a Muslim in Myanmar, how would you react there? We can't sit here in the front line club in you might and, 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 um, and, and that's a completely different argument. But we talk about Britain and what kind of Britain we're in, then it's about fighting for lawfulness and, and protecting a state that gives people law. That's what I believe, and terrorism is therefore off the agenda. Okay, I, uh, you may have noticed we've been talking up here for a while. Um, if, if anyone would like uh, to make a contribution, I can get a microphone to you. Uh, you can either pose a question to the whole panel or pose a question to an individual on the panel. Uh, and we have some of it. Do I have to stand up? No, you don't have to stand up. No, not not. It's a small audience. It's just like for my camera. Huh? If you wouldn't mind, make the shot back. It's not about virtuality, young man. It's about reality. You're very cool. Thank you. Um, thanks all for your contributions. Um, I do feel slightly like it is a panel of men stuck in their ways and not listening to oh, each other. Oh, right. But uh, that's okay. Um, I'm, I'm offended by the fact you're assuming my gender. <laughs> Me too. Did I not encounter you outside the, the women's toilet, toilet and tell yeah. you that I was transitioning? Yes. <laughs> um, so, the whole point of this event isn't about defending liberal democracy. Not very well, admittedly. Yeah, even that. Um, it's not about talking about whether or not or when terrorism is justified. Um, it's about once the label of terrorism is applied either to an individual or a group. So for example, like random example, but this is about Northern Ireland, but PKK in Turkey, the movement, it's officially labeled as a terrorist organization. Yes. Um, it's about how they are treated in terms of civil rights after that label is applied. It's not about whether the label is correct or incorrect, although obviously that is a huge factor. <coughs> so it's about how it is applied, and I would ask Pat first in terms of, sorry, I'm ill, so I'm actually, <laughs> Pat, in terms of how, when, once you are labeled a terrorist, how, what exactly were the rights you felt were taken away? And in terms of the rest of the panel, uh, just answering the question of the talk. <laughs> Well, uh, terrorism, terrorists, it's like all these labels, they provide certainty, doesn't it? It uh, means you don't have to question, but you know the answer, terrorist. You know how to deal with that. There's a file that tells you this, uh, you can deal with terrorists all over the world, you know. Put that stamp on, it's easy. I can remember, um, before I joined the IRA, I was uh, arrested in Belfast, out of a, a club. Everybody in the club was arrested, totally, and uh, the wrong men. And uh, I was held for, uh, I think it was uh, 48 hours, you know. And about, I think, 24 hours into it, they knew I, I, I had nothing to do with anything, you know, absolutely knew. But said, we're going to have to keep you until somebody sorts it out. And, I think that was my first experience of what I felt was something uh, um, uh, evil, you know, uh, there's no part of my understanding of anything, 
but it felt so horrible, <coughs> you know, horrible. That it's the nearest thing I felt. I felt absolutely. The moment I was in there, I was treated like dirt. To the moment I got out, but and they knew I wasn't involved in anything. And so somebody had, uh, as I said, applied a, a label to a community and uh, ma enabling us to be lifted at will in some form of screening operation, which had been employed in other theatres of war all over the world by the British Army and uh, other nations' armies. And uh, that's what you do. You know, you don't have to question once you put that label down. You know, all the awkward questions are, you know, Black and white. That's what labels do. The question, the question asks that we answer the question. So, do should terrorists have rights? Yeah, in simple terms, uh, it is what it says on the tin: they human rights. And the question can be reinterpreted as to can a human being ever behave in a way that stops them from being a human being, effectively? And I think the answer to that is no. Um, that's that's the majority position in terms of where we are at the moment on that. Um, in terms of this discussion, we've been assuming that terrorism means killing people. But of course, on the <coughs> tables, terrorism can be a crime of omission, simply not reporting somebody that you knew, or reading a book, actually, uh, is terrorism as well. So the idea that terrorists uh, shouldn't be given human rights, well, there's a whole range of behaviours that go from very much buying a book or downloading one, all the way up to sending a tweet. Um, sending a tweet or indeed up, up, up the scale to you know, blowing people up. So the problem is a label, once applied, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't delineate which part of the range of terrorism offences you're on. And there are many people in this country who were arrested for terrorism um, and released without charge, no further action taken. But once that label had been applied, then banks have refused to open accounts for them, they've been economically incapable of actually functioning, uh, because the name has been in the press, uh, then they can't get a job and they can't travel abroad <coughs> because different countries have different interpretations of what a terrorist is. So once that label's been applied, you may find yourself unable to go to another country, even though you've not been convicted of, of anything. Um, and one of the other issues that, that is problematic in this interconnected and interdependent world is that different jurisdictions count different people as terrorists. So for example, Ihaha, which is a Turkish charity and a, uh, a partner to the uh, UN on delivery of aid, is classified as a terrorist organization by Israel. So if you were to volunteer for a noble, well, from a European point of view, a, a noble cause of uh, working with a charity to deliver aid to people, you may find yourself arrested in, in Israel if you were to ever travel there as a, as a, as a terrorist. So we have problems with definitions, and we have problems conceptually as well, with the idea of what, what, what even a terrorist is. Um, and I think what we've done really now is water down the idea of what terrorism is, so that it is literally now a, an ability, an arbitrary ability by the state to just label the undesirables you know, out of the equation, basically. It, it, well, if you could suspend your objection to the question of human rights, uh, uh, how would you respond uh, to what the question asks, which is, do they do terrorists? Well, I, no, I won't suspend my objection to the term <coughs> human rights. I okay. think it's key, and the obfuscations and confusions of the panelists in, in discussing it arise from the term human rights, because it encourages us in the delusion that we live in one jurisdiction, and that you made the excellent point of how... And, and Anthony encourages in the, in the delusion, uh, you know, it's a classic British point of view. The British love the uchronic. They love the idea, not the utopic, but the idea that there's something that exists outside of time that is purer and truer. And every time Anthony talks about liberal democracy, he's talking about something uchronic rather than contingent upon actual political situations in the real world. So, in answer to your question, do terrorists have human rights? No, they do not, because nobody has human rights. Do Britons who have gone to fight for ISIS abroad, even if they've torn up their British passport and declared war on the British state, are they still subject to the same rights as any other British citizen? Of course they are. You're, you're still subject to the, the same rights as any other British citizen if you're guilty of treason. It makes no sense. I'm fascinated by the way the British case, the, the British state 
makes a case for the idea that these people represent some existential threat to it, armed with their carving knives and their transit vans and their orange jumpsuits, but that's their argument, okay? It's not my argument. Uh, I, mean, I think, I, I'll, I actually unfortunately have to leave, but I'll just say this before I go as my doorknob remark. I think one of the most pitiful, sad sights I've witnessed in, in years was sitting on a question time panel a year or two ago and watching an audience bay for the blood of people who had gone to fight for ISIS. Actually kind of bay for their blood. And these were Britons of all hues, all ethnicities and heritages. It was irrespective. These people had become panapathnogens, evil, universally evil substances to be eradicated. And that was a psychological need on the part of that audience. It enabled them, and you're not going to like this, but you like very little, uh, it enabled them not to look what was on the end of their fork, which was that the British state itself was responsible contingently for the conditions that had drawn these people into terrorism. And that's all I have to say on the matter. But it's been fun. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Um, so, Will manages to walk out before Anthony did. But, um, and well, he, he, he walks out having kind of delivered, as he put, a doorknob uh, remark, which implies to me he's not actually very interested in hearing whether there is a response to what he said. So, a sort of ex cathedra uh, <coughs> attitude, and that's it, and he's off. Frank, Frank, all, 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 all I would say I in respect... But you know what, my life's too short to bother arguing with you, you're right. <laughs> okay, Anthony, just forget that for a second. Did, am, I, am, I, am I right in thinking from all that you originally said, that you did answer the question, that you do believe terrorists... Uh, at that moment that they become terrorists don't deserve to have the same rights no, well, you, didn't, I, you, 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 you didn't hear I, and I, you didn't hear madam you said the panel hadn't answered the question I think we all answered the question we all answered the same way that even terrorists have human rights, I said it so uh, you, you know you don't like somebody like me saying it, that's a, that's a different matter I don't, I don't think I, 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 oh, I, I, no. I, of course the whole point of a lawful liberal democracy is that it accepts people have rights. Of course they have rights. Now, the, the discussion could have gone, I'm the chairman of the discussion, it could have gone into questions of, of war crimes, for example. And I spent two years working for the British government 30 years ago in <coughs> war crimes inquiry. And um, I know, you know a little bit more than perhaps many people about what war crimes are, but I've also seen at first hand how Margaret Thatcher went after people who committed war crimes. We wouldn't have had um, Mladic and Milosevic and all these people tried in the way they have been tried and justly tried and justly sentenced, my goodness, justly sentenced, if people like Margaret Thatcher hadn't stood up for the principle that people who have committed war crimes should be brought to justice, should be hunted down, however many years well, So, okay. so that's, that is, that that is that just just the, the, the answer to, to, to that question. Yes, we, we, we do think yeah. that people have human rights. That's what makes us liberal I, 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 I think the Chilean people had human rights. Um, there, thank you. And, and I'll come to you after. Well, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a student of um, terrorism studies at a master's level. I came from Derby, and I'm very delighted to the lovely conversations here. My question really tonight is really finding out whether or not liberal democracy application of the understanding of terrorism from a policy point of view, is it really solving problems? Is it really reversing, reducing terrorism? Is it reducing violence? Or is it the liberal democracy policy and attitude towards otherness and terrorism? Is it escalating? That's my question. So, all right, do you want to come back on that? No, I, I, all I wanted to say is that I also totally disagree with what we hear, heard here about the changing definition of, of terrorism. It's a very simple definition of terrorism that the British government uses, that other European Union governments use, and that a terrorist is somebody who tries to change policy 
by using violent means to do so. So, so that is what terrorism is. And, 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 and when we hear a lawyer say it's arbitrary, I'm afraid to say, I think that is complete nonsense. Your, 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 your question, well, in a way, I, I don't think I need to answer it because you know what I think, that a liberal democracy is a very vulnerable thing and it has to protect itself against those who wish to destroy it. Liberal democracies are being destroyed all the time, historically, repeatedly. At the moment, this country is in a very funny place. I'm not going to say it's just because of Brexit. It's in a funny place before. But where people get blown up, the Manchester Arena, bombings, London Bridge, Westminster Bridge, etc. I think this country is remarkable, actually, in the extent to which it has been prepared to let police, intelligence agencies, and the courts deal with this issue. We haven't had people out on the streets baying, baying for, for blood, and I know when he's not here, so it's not complicated. Okay, uh, before, before your question, Tan, Tasmin is coming back. Yeah. Well, first of all, if you stick to the history, I'll stick to the law, then we might get somewhere. Because this country doesn't have a very simple definition of terrorism at all. If you look at the Terrorism Act, it goes into issues to do with damage to property or even health and safety issues are classed as, as, uh, as terrorist offences. And beyond that, the idea that we have an entirely transparent judicial system to deal with terrorism-related matters is a bit of a joke. We have a thing called the TPIM orders, where we have secret evidence that the, the uh, accused isn't allowed to see and yet that there's a, there's a process that leads to that person's incarceration or otherwise. On the back of that, we're now introducing uh, secret evidence in, in trials as well. And, and sometimes that is necessary, it's accepted. But some of these measures have been classed as draconian even by the rapporteur, uh, the UN rapporteur quite recently. Um, beyond that, in terms of is it working, is it causing otherness, um, we've been pouring billions into uh, counterterrorism measures uh, across the board, policing, uh, security services, uh, army, and, and in terms of um, the judicial system as well. Um, and the threat level hasn't gone down. It just keeps going up. And the Independent Review of Terrorism at the moment, Max Hill, um, is himself a prosecutor of terrorism um, cases where he was prosecuting, he defend, but he has now been appointed as the Independent Review of Terrorism. His opinion, quite plainly stated, was that most of these laws, terrorism laws, need to be taken off the books. Okay, ma'am. Okay, hello, hello, evening everyone. Um, so I'm, I'm a Zimbabwean, so I have a particular perspective on the conversation we've been having today, not, notwithstanding the recent events um, that, that, that happened the last, uh, the last week. You know, I emphasize it was not a coup, <laughs> as everyone has been saying. Um, so I have, I have two questions, one um, to each side of the argument. So, you know, you referenced Margaret Thatcher, you were talking about uh, a very absolute, very um, you know, very objective view of, of, of how what a, what a terrorist is and, and, and how they should be treated. My question to you, um, Professor um, Anthony, is given that sort of attitude and position, how do you square up the attitude of Britain to liberal fighters um, such as Robert Mugabe or um, or, 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 or Mozambique, etc., who during the time of you know, the, the, the liberation struggle would have been labelled as terrorists by virtue of the means that they were using to pursue their political ends, but thereafter, um, you know, were, were were statesmen and 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 embraced by the West. Yeah, how do you how do you how do you square that up? And that's recent history as well. Okay, that's a, well, so, you have a second, second question. You know, the second question to the which other will be short, I'm which sure. Will be short. Yeah. To the second to the other side of the of the of the debate, <coughs> you know, if terrorists all terrorists have have rights, um, how do you then deal with, uh, again, ZANU-PF uh, in Zimbabwe, who have now been deposed. So this is a, a government that was ineffectively a state that was uh, using um, fear and, and, and intimidation and violence to subdue people. Now that they have been deposed, they you know, have in retrospect been terrorists. Do they have rights now no, that they're no longer the, the state? So that's, those are my questions. Okay, well that, that first question, uh, uh, not putting down your second question, but the first question is really interesting. In liberation struggles, we, we do tend to, I mean, it, it, Mandela was called a terrorist. Uh, we, we do tend to call those oppositions, uh, oppositionist terrorists. We've had a reference to the PKK who could make it, or the Kurds, we could, uh, generally, we could make the same point. How does that fit in with your 
Well, I, 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 thank you. I think I've made my position actually quite clear that what I have studied and what I feel entitled to talk about relates to liberal democracies and how liberal democracies uh, uh, uh. act towards other liberal democracies. You know, you want to go back to colonialism, the slave trade, the, our attitude to uh, Rhodesia as it, as it then was. Um, all I would say is I don't think I've heard anybody describe Robert Mugabe as a liberal. I think he said he was a liberal. And as for, as for his being a statesman, I'm sorry, madam, I couldn't disagree with you more. I think he's a, he'd been an awful leader, and I think it's wonderful <laughs> that he's gone, finally. He should have gone before. Has the record, have the record of European states in black Africa been good or bad? They've been appalling. Of course they have. I, 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 you can't... You know, this is this isn't about history. It, it's not about the, the past. It's about where we are now. In as I said, my lifetime since since the Second World War, was the policy towards Robert Mugabe, and I, I I honestly don't think I can judge that. But the people, what is interesting is the people of Zimbabwe do not think that Mugabe is to be seen as a liberal statesman. They are jubilant that he has gone. So whether we were right to fight him or not, oh, God knows. Okay, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna uh, just stick to that single question. You can uh, perhaps, you and Anthony can have a dance together later. Um, yeah. I, I'm gonna take two more questions because we have run out of time. I, I'll come to you after, sir, yeah. Hey, I'm a student at ESCP University here in London. Um, I'm from Germany. And I have a really short question to Mr. McGee. And I was wondering, like, what's your definition of, of a terrorist? Oh, yeah. go on, Pat. Yeah. I would never use the term. But, uh, it doesn't fit anything I would recognize. Um, I wouldn't even use it against the British state. You know, it's a, it's a, a tactic. Uh, you know, yeah. You can make the argument that uh, they use repression, etc. The British state used repression, and therefore its the effect was terroristic. You know, to me, the the word has no substance. You know, it's it's uh, it's not there to explain anything. In fact, it's to obscure some realities, and it's about the nature of power. Who has it? And who's fighting to you know to get a semblance of it? I guess. Uh, so I would never use that word, terrorist. Last one. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, and this is to um, Professor Green. Um, you talked about the sort of protecting the liberal democratic state, which sort of offers uh, legality, um, and yet you dismiss its action, the, the, the actions or the attitude of the liberal democratic state abroad. And this is sort of in your lifetime. What I'm a key sort of proponent of the rule of law as an inspiring lawyer. What I take issue with is with the selective um, application of standards. So how can you describe it, a liberal democratic state as offering uh, legality when um, at the same time, during your lifetime, for example, in, in Kenya during the Mau Mau uprising, we were employing concentration camps. Um, and Or if we're talking about another liberal democratic state, uh, the United States recently, the uh, discoveries uh, by the Senate of the, uh, of the use of torture by the CIA that has now almost universally been accepted as, as a breach of international law. So I think, the, your attitude, I think there shouldn't be a, a different standard applied to, to those who are not citizens of a democratic state uh, uh, as to those who are. And, um, as, yeah, okay, well, I, th I think yeah. we, get, we, we get where you're coming right. from. Anthony, do you want well, to I, could, I, could, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And um, one of the important aspects of a liberal democracy is that one has freedom of speech and recourse to the law. The way the Mau Mau uh, w were treated was utterly appalling. And I'm able to say that, and I'm able to be a professor at a university that sometimes is seen as a right-wing university, is that not, 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 not actually the case. Please see that the most vicious attack on me came from a fellow academic, as I say. But uh, of course, one cannot throw out the baby uh, with the bathwater. And um, liberal de dem democracies.
carry with them, on the one hand, the seeds of their destruction, but also the seeds of their improvement. And that enables us to have things like war crimes inquiries, to examine what the Mao Mao did, to, to look at what happened in places like Zimbabwe. If you think I'm saying everything that every British government did in my lifetime was wonderful, sir, you misunderstand me very deeply. All I'm saying is, you could say it's a kind of classic British idea that, you know, democracy stinks, but it is better than all the other forms of government because they stink even more. And I suppose that is what I believe, but I've never, ju never justified, never justified what was done. And we don't. And even if you look at MI5, for example, MI5 officers were pulled out of Guantanamo Bay the moment they realized the Americans were using torture. And I've always said, you mentioned that, you know, I'm on the editorial board of the Journal of Ethics. I've always called out waterboarding as torture. I don't criticize Bush for talking about the war on terror. That doesn't trouble me. And he, he did what any American would have to do after, after American president would have to do after 9-11. Does that justify the use of torture? Absolutely not. It was an utterly foolish thing to do. But even our most secret agency did not want to have anything to do, to do with that. Now, I'm not saying they haven't made mistakes. I'm not saying we all make mistakes. I made plenty of mistakes. But transparency, lawfulness, that is, is really, really important. That's okay. okay. Thank you. Um, my mistake, of course, was uh, in always thinking of a question that I'd now like to ask, now that someone's raised torture, about the hooded men in Belfast. But now I can't, um, because it's too late. Um, do you want to say something, Dimitris? It, it was a quick reaction. Is it lawfulness, <clears throat> or is it sometimes the pretension of lawfulness? Sir? So we had Belmars in this country, which was legitimized. Belmarsh, did you say? Yes, yes Belmars. Uh, okay. uh, until exactly until the Supreme Court and people like Tom Bingham intervened, uh, uh, then we had uh, the equivalent of house arrest. We we have you know TPIMs which are not very far from, from house arrest. So these are legal and lawful, but are the, are the same. But you don't like them. I like no, them. No, I feel safer with them. You don't. We can do it. I, but I feel, Demetrius, uh, as an organizer of the event, it would be bad of you, wouldn't it, to extend the event beyond the time I do. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Anthony, I want to thank Tasmin, I want to thank Pat McGee, and um, a posthumous thanks to Wilson. No, not posthumous. <laughs> In a way. Okay, thank you. Uh, give your speakers a <laughs>